Welcome to Hyper Polygon Activist, Learn Languages, Make a Difference. My name is Dr. Carlos Diego Lopez, and I'm joined today by Simon Ega from Wales. Simon, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Mm -hmm. Doing great. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. And so, no problem. first of all, just a little brief introduction for those of you who are not familiar with you or, or your platform. So, Simon Ega is the director of Omniglot, right? Uh, originally from Lancashire, England, but now residing in Wales. Mm -hmm. And you speak pretty good uh, Welsh, fluent in, in that and other languages, so um, a polyglot uh, as well. And Omniglot.com, which is fascinating, you can find the link in the description, please click right after this interview is an encyclopedia of writing systems and languages, right? If I'm not mistaken, it features 345 writing systems, which is a lot, and mm -hmm. then 1,800 languages, right? And it is yeah. a limited company since 2008, and it's a one-man operation, meaning everything is under your administration, correct? That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first question that I would like to ask you is, how did you come up with this idea? What motivated you to, to start this initiative? Well, I, I've always been interested in languages. Um, I studied French and German at school. And then after I finished school, I had a, an idea that I could learn all the world's languages. Uh -huh. I could learn two every year because I, I'd heard somewhere you could learn a language in six months. So I thought, right, I'll learn two new languages every year. And then I didn't know at the time how many languages there were in the world. Right. Okay, but, so it's um, good you that, that if you learn two each year, you could eventually become a learn language, all. right? All the languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you wanted to learn all the world's languages, there's over 7,000. Mm -hmm. It would take you several lifetimes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but you could always cover them all in an encyclopedia, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my original aim um, was to to start a, a business doing web design and translation. Mm -hmm. I'd been working in Taiwan for the British Council mm -hmm. for five years, and then I came back to the UK and decided to start my own business. Mm -hmm. So I tried to do that for a year. I was living with my parents, looking for other jobs, paying for interviews around the UK. Yeah. And eventually I was offered a job in Brighton, in the south of the UK, um, as a web designer, designing yeah. multilingual websites. And I did that for nine years. And while I was working there, I was working on a lot in my spare time, building it up. Originally, it was just a website I made from little, my own little business. Mm -hmm. But then I started adding information about languages I knew about and interested in writing systems. That I'd studied Chinese and Japanese at university, so I was familiar with the Chinese and Japanese scripts. Mm -hmm. And while studying those, I went to Taiwan and Japan to study. And in Taiwan, I had some friends from Korea who taught me the Korean alphabet. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered there's all sorts of other alphabets in the world, and I started learning about those and thought I'd share that information on my website. Mm -hmm. Awesome, and awesome. And, and so my next question will be then, why writing systems? What attracts you in particular out of all the aspects that we can see in language, say phonology, etc. Why writing systems in, in particular? What is it so special about them? Because there's so many and they're so diverse in the way they represent languages and sounds. There's once you've studied um, Chinese or Japanese or a language that uses characters, mm -hmm. you open to a whole new world of ways to represent language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you see, if you start looking at, into other languages and writing systems, you see there's so many different ways you can put the, the symbols together and sounds together and represent um, spoken language in, in visual form. And many of the, the writing systems I've come across are very attractive, very appealing. Mm -hmm. 
aesthetically, like the the ones in India, especially southern India. I like all the the curly scripts, like uh, Tamil and Sinhalese, and, mm-hmm. and in and Southeast Asia as well. There's many interesting scripts there. Mm-hmm. And and writing is is a technology, right? So there's a lot of languages that do not feature their own writing system, right? So so in, in your encyclopedia, there are, as I said, one thousand eight hundred languages relative to 345 writing systems and i assume that some of these languages correspond to several writing systems right so mm, how, many exactly. you, how many would you say roughly of the languages that that are included there 1800 do not feature a writing uh, system well uh, i have 1000 nearly 1400 languages written with the latin alphabet that's the most mm-hmm. widely used alphabet Mm-hmm. And then the other ones that are widely used are Cyrillic, the Arabic script, and um, various Indian Indian scripts like Devanagari. And the Hebrew is used for quite used to write quite a few, or used to be used mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to write quite a few languages. Exactly. So mm-hmm. most writing systems are only used to write one or two languages. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Uh... And this is very important, right? Because when we're considering different writing systems, out of the sheer diversity, we can appreciate, say, aesthetic elements, but also there are ideological elements, right, intertwined with the Absolutely. writing systems. And, and one of the most important issues, I think, is, is this trend known as pan-Latinism, right? This global trend mm-hmm. of transitioning eventually every language, right, of Nicolot, into its own system of Latin transliteration. What do you think about this trend and how do you see it evolving in the future? Well, you can see it um, particularly in the former Soviet um, countries, Mm -hmm. in Turkic speaking countries like Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan and the the other Central Asian countries. Mm -hmm. They have gone through several changes over the course of the past century or so. In the 1920s, when Turkey decided to switch from the Arabic script to the Latin script, mm-hmm. many of the other peoples who, who speak Turkic languages decided to do the same thing. Right. But then in the 1930s, in the Soviet countries, Stalin said, no, you have to write the Soviet script. So they had to switch over again. But after they gained independence in the 90s, some of them decided, yes, maybe we'll go back to the Latin alphabet, but not the one they, was u- they were using in the 1920s, a different version. Right, and mm-hmm. some have you know had several different versions since then. Mm-hmm. Um, like Serbia, they use both. Some mm-hmm. yeah, some countries you use both scripts, Latin and Cyrillic. Mm-hmm. Um, and it must be very confusing if you've grown up over this period and you mm-hmm. learn to write in one, and then you have to learn a whole new one. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, and and it's possible, as you said, to generate different versions, right? Even within the same uh, writing system. And so, for instance, when it comes to Judeo Spanish or Ladino, the language I specialize in, we see a lot of tension between, on the one hand, transliteration, mm-hmm. by which I mean specifically making one letter in one writing system correspond to another letter in the other writing system, and then what is called phonemic transcription meaning adapting the sound to the writing system, right? So mm-hmm. sometimes if you, if you do a letter-to-letter correspondence, a transliteration in the strict sense of the term, that does not preserve the original sound, but vice mm-hmm. versa, if you preserve the original sound, sometimes it's at the expense of sacrificing the letter correspondence, right? Do you see this, this being a problem in other languages that you include in the encyclopedia? It, it is. Um, yes, producing a, an orthography that is... Um, represents the sounds faithfully, but is also practical, mm-hmm. is a real challenge. Right. Mm-hmm. Especially in languages that have a, a very um, large inventory of phonemes, mm-hmm. like some of the languages in, in North America, in the, on the West Coast, the Cilician languages have a huge number of consonants. Right. And various ways have been devised to write them. Some just use the IPA or a mm-hmm. modified version of it. Mm-hmm. And for practical purposes, that's very difficult to use right. in your everyday mm-hmm. life because keyboards don't, are not, not designed for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So I don't know how how much these these systems are actually used. Mm-hmm. So you know, when com- somebody comes up, when a linguist maybe devises these, mm-hmm. they need to talk to the the people who are actually going to use the language right. and find solutions and mm-hmm. say, okay, I think we should use this this letter or this symbol. What do you think? Can you would this work for you? Yeah, I think this is really important. Um, Gilad Zuckerman emphasizes that in his volume, Revivalistics, that you need to work around the community rather than just on their behalf. Because sometimes as a linguist with all best intentions, you design something that you believe is the most accurate, the best one, but then it's not practical, right? So Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then in, in parts of India, I've seen a lot of people are very keen to have a, their own script for their, own, for their language. Mm-hmm. They may use an, uh, an existing one or, already, or they may maybe their language is not really written at all. Mm-hmm. So either they they adapt an existing script mm-hmm. like Devanagari or Bengali or whatever, or they they come up with their own one. Mm-hmm. And when when you come up with a new script, that adds a whole layer of complexity mm-hmm. because you know are there um, keyboards and fonts and mm-hmm. input methods available for it. Mm-hmm. Is it in Unicode? If it isn't, but, then it's very difficult to use. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And uh, what what makes a community want to take the step to develop a writing system? And what are the consequences from the point of view of the valuation of that language? So what I mean is this, according to some linguists, when communities don't have a script and then they come to have one, they see it as a sign of progress, as something that makes their language worthy of literary prestige, of tradition, of of honor, of prestige, right? And mm-hmm. do you feel that's been the case with the languages that have adopted a writing system? I, I think so, yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, certainly. Um, sometimes it's just one person decides to do this. Sometimes it's, it's a group of people, it depends. Sometimes there may be competing um, writing mm-hmm. systems. Mm-hmm. Like in, in Somalia, mm-hmm. they have many different ways to write Somali. Mm-hmm. And they have the committee to assess them and try and work out which one was the best one. Mm-hmm. Eventually, the Latin alphabet right. is chosen, but many others are available. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, is, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, it is, it is a matter of pride and showing that you, you are, your language is special. It has its own identity. Right. So, so you, ha- you haven't encountered the opposite, right? Uh, say a community of speakers or, or a speaker within that community that believes that adopting a writing system is the wrong move to make for, for that language and that take pride uh, that is entirely oral? Uh, that might might be the case. I haven't come across that, yes. Right, no, or there may be yeah, you know, one person has designed their own way to write the language mm-hmm. but other community members are not keen on using it. That, mm-hmm. that certainly happens. <laughs> but they might still agree with using a writing system, even if it's not exactly a- yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so tell us a little bit what happens, um, say behind the scenes, right? So uh, how do you, out of the, all the writing systems and languages of which an entry is available on uh, Omniglot, how many? of those languages were helped by say volunteers that just decided to provide you with a template or information on the language or the writing system. And how many of those did you actually take the, the active lead on that? You, you researched that and decided to incorporate it on your own without influence from, or previous notice from other people. I'm not sure exactly what, what percentage um, uh, yeah, I have I mean, help with, um, and there's a few people, a few contributors who regularly send me information. Okay, and um, some will just send me one one language at a time. Someone will send me a whole list of languages they've, mm-hmm. they've done the research for, mm-hmm. and that that was enormously helpful for me. Mm-hmm. Normally, when I'm looking for a language to add, I will look on Wikipedia first and see what information is available there. Often there's not very much, mm-hmm. because I have all the, ma- the major languages of the world already. 
Right. So I'm looking at the, the less well documented ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I look at the English page first and see if the other languages have any more information and look at the links and follow those. Mm -hmm. Quite often I'll find someone's written a PhD thesis, right. a sketch grammar or, or some other um, descriptions of language, and I use those. Right. Mm -hmm. So those are very useful, especially for the more obscure languages. Mm -hmm. And they, they may not may be obscure to me and to most people, but for people to speak them, obviously they're, right. they're very important. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I do get um, some, sometimes. You know, I'll, I'll do all the research and put the language page on. Then someone will send me corrections and mm -hmm. new information. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will send me the information and I put it together and add it to the mm -hmm. site. Right. Yeah, because well, what I found in the case of the Ladino that you do a Spanish one was amazing because I've seen a lot of ways of going about it and it's writing systems. I've seen tables from Brian Berman or Brian Kirshen or other scholars, but I had never seen that which I saw at Omnigo, which was the three Hebrew scripts, one right under the other. So it's very yeah. to compare them at a glance. And I think that that is very um, pedagogically useful, right? Mm. Yeah, well, I, I try to make make the the, the alphabet charts I, I create mm -hmm. as as useful as possible. Yeah, mm -hmm. and with with um, right to left scripts, I always do them in the right to left orientation. Right. Yes, I noticed that too. So, would you say that the primary intent of each entry is documentary, or rather than pedagogical, vice versa, an equilibrium between both? It's it's a, a balance between the two, I think. Right. I mean, I don't go into great depth in with most languages because I just don't have the time and, right. and resources to mm -hmm. to add, you know, a descript a grammatical description or right, right. or mm -hmm. more information. I'd love to be able to do that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um, you know, I, it's just me who's <laughs> doing this. Right. And and I also realized that uh, in addition to the main website, the omniglot.com, there's a number of offshoots, right? There's a Facebook yeah. group, there's a TikTok, Instagram. Out of those, um, which one is your favorite or the one that has attracted the most attention? Well, I think I get most uh, views on TikTok, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of, some of the ones I posted there get several thousand, several thousand views. Oh, wow. I, I can see that it's more difficult to see on, on OmniGot. Mm -hmm. itself i have analytics and i can look right. into each page and how many views it gets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i know for example my korean phrases page is very popular mm -hmm. right. i don't know why korean is, is a popular language at the moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um you know I, I don't don't spend a lot of time analyzing you know, which page is most popular and right. i just mm -hmm. kind of look at it occasionally mm -hmm. and and how do you adapt that content from Omnicloud to TikTok? Do you use, for instance, um, subtitles or take screenshots of the of the writing system in question? How do you introduce a new writing system to an audience that is unfamiliar with it? Well, the, the videos I make, which I post on TikTok and used to YouTube and Instagram, those are specifically for, for their, they're mm -hmm. based on podcasts I make for, for my Radio Omniglot podcast. Mm -hmm. And I have several series on there. I have the Adventures in Etymology, mm -hmm. where I take a word in English usually and then look into its roots and find whatever words are connected to it in English and other languages. Mm -hmm. And then when I, I, I write a script, I mean, that's my the post on, on my, the Radio Omniglot blog. Mm -hmm. And then I record that and make a video with just the words. And maybe a few images to go with it. Right, right, right. right. Mm -hmm. So, you, so it's, it's basically a, a lyric, um, like a lyric video for a song. You just you mm -hmm. got the words coming up on the right. screen. Okay, mm -hmm. very interesting. And what would you say is the is the most um, rewarding aspect of Omniglot, or has been your one of your best experiences uh, throughout these years? I think. Um, I, well, I, I like finding information and finding things I didn't know before. So if I find a new writing system, that's exciting. You know, oh, they've got this over here. And, oh, wow, that's interesting. And uh, finding out about languages. and um, But particularly, it's making connections with people. 
So all the people who contact me, right. you know, they're, they're sending me information or corrections or saying how much they like the site or just saying hello or whatever. And I, I like those connections. Mm -hmm. Why did it that's, that's part of why I learn languages. It's not, not just about I'm, I'm a language nerd, I like, I'm interested in languages, I'm actually interested in what they represent. It's not just about words and grammar and, and yeah. everything. Yeah. It's, it's about the culture and people and yes. the history and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's not a merely, a merely formal endeavor, but it's actually, yeah, social, it's social linguistic, right? The cultural. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, much more well rounded uh, effort. Yeah. Yeah. And so I found extremely useful your uh, frequently asked questions section. It's very exhaustive. Mm -hmm. So that's, I would recommend for anybody who's about to go to omniglobe.com, check out this, this uh, frequently asked questions uh, first section. And then how would people who appreciate the value that we're bringing with this interview and really want to get deeper into Omnigod, how should they proceed? Uh, because I've seen different sections on the website, right? You have one for writing systems, another one for mm -hmm. scripts, languages, multilingual pages, what's new? Where should one start with all this information? It depends what your interest is. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in a specific language, then find all the information on that language. Go to the language page and there'll be links to all the other information I have for that language. Mm -hmm. um, something I've started doing um, is putting a, a kind of content, a list of content mm -hmm. at the top of the language page so you can see, okay, what's on that page and whatever pages I have linked to that. So it'd be phrases and numbers and mm -hmm. other stuff I've got, telling the time, talking about the weather, whatever mm -hmm. information I've been able to gather for that language. So. That's if you're interested in a particular language. If you're just generally interested in, say, writing systems, just explore that, that bit. If you want to know, learn about the origins of words, have a look at the Omnigot blog and the Radio mm -hmm. Omnigot blog as well. Mm -hmm. And my Celtiadia blog, if you're interested in Celtic languages particularly. Mm -hmm. That's one of my uh, major interests, finding mm -hmm. connections between the Celtic languages, words that are cognate in all or some of them and looking for words with Celtic roots in other languages as well. Mm -hmm. That's what I talk about on my Celtic Pathways podcast. Mm -hmm. Right. And, so, um, uh -huh. I found quite a few in, in Spanish and Galician and French mm. particularly. Yeah. So obviously we're trying to be encompassing, right? In this, in this website is Omniglot. There, there is an all yeah. impetus to it, but at the same time, each polyglot, each omniglot has its own area of specialization. Would you say mm -hmm. that yours is Celtic language plus something else? What, what would you say is your, is your area of the utmost expertise within all these writing I'd systems? I'd say writing systems and the Celtic languages, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very interested in constructed scripts as well. So people send me, send me their scripts. And so it's very interesting to see how they... They put them together and mm -hmm. constructed scripts will be the uh, script equivalent to conglangs or constructed languages. Yep, yeah, more or less. They may be, yes, devised for an existing language. So it's an alternative way to write English or French or Hebrew or whatever. Or it may be for a, a constructed language. You know, someone's mm -hmm. come up with a language and here's a script for it. Mm -hmm. Or they may be used in books or films or video games or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, fascinating. So Simon, I promised a 30 minute interview We're around uh, that time mark, but is there anything else you would like to add for people to know about Omniglot or about your work? Um, well, yeah, obviously I hope <laughs> many people will visit the site and um, enjoy what they see and share it with their friends um, and look at all the offshoots as well on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and uh, listen to the podcast if they're interested in that. So, yeah, I just hope people will enjoy it and find it useful and share it and all that sort of thing. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. Uh, Omniglot is, is now a reference page in the, in the whole Polyglot space, and, and I'm sure people will be delighted at the content that they will find there. So thank you so much, Simon, for this interview. And You're welcome. And good luck with Omniglot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.